Are you saying the, the, the girl slaughter? Can you explain? I haven't, um, I haven't heard it, but... Well, I think it was happening more um, extensively in the 80s, but it still does happen in China, for instance. There's, there's such a thing as orphanages that are called dying rooms where families that don't outright want to kill their children or you know throw them in the dumpster as some do they send them to these orphanages where they basically just die over a short period of time from neglect and malnutrition there there's places where it's very inconvenient to have a girl child or it's expensive because in order for them to get married you have to pay for the other family and they can't earn any money and I mean those are more kind of economic reasons but there's a really long list of reasons why it's not um, desirable to have girl children see so what you, you were saying well we're now in a, in a sort of uh, tr transition phase um, do you really think, because men are still dominating, more or less, especially this story that's, well, it's, this, they it still shows. are, yeah. Um, some people seem to be close, close-minded and, and becoming more close-minded, but there's another people that are starting to learn a vocabulary. You know, questions are being asked that weren't asked before. Things are being covered in the media that didn't have so much attention. And there is, you know, there is a change in the temperature of people's consciousness. It's very subtle, but it gives a small grain of hope so it's that tiny, you know, vocabulary that people are starting to be more aware of and use that you know, bring, brings the, you know, the excitement, something small. Yeah. And what is the role of religion in this, in this well, transition? Because I think the world, religion is still more, mainly more focused on men. Mm -hmm. so, well, for us, religion is definitely something that needs to be removed in order to begin the ability to have more more accurate perceptions about about gender, the illusion of male spiritual superiority that is served in most religions, particularly the sky god religions. In our perspective, it, it's, it has a very big hand in, really in a lot of the, in a lot of the world's problems, but particularly the, the oppression of women. And it's, it's getting very, um, it's really boring to see more, to see a new pope and to see, mm. to see men on television wearing these old garments. It's, it's really, it feels over, it feels over for us. Like, like there's some, we're really stuck in the past and it seems totally irrelevant. Like, it's not helpful at all. And it's complicated because I think getting rid of a male god could leave a kind of hole, a kind of void for a lot of people who need, need something to worship or need some kind of um, spirituality. And so we've been redirecting our, our focus towards the earth and considering ourselves as you know children and creatures of the earth rather than something from the sky and how do you connect with the earth on a daily basis 
Is it something you do, let's say, half an hour a day, you're refocusing on, or mm. is it some change you've had, let's say, the last 10 or 15 years? I don't, I don't know when this idea for you came up. Or? Well, we definitely take our phases of of being in nature, and it's where we do a lot of our writing. But it's not even so much about that. Um, it's more about being present and and being accountable for ourselves here and not not escaping to some kind of a fantasical place and not um, you know getting rid of this idea of, of God judging us and promising us things if we if we do right, but um, yeah, being present and accountable for um, for what we're doing here now, opposed to the idea that we can trash the earth and it doesn't matter, God's going to let us through the gates of heaven and we'll figure out and be able to have 40 mm. wives once we pass those gates, it, you know. It sounds really silly when we talk about it like this, but this is... Yeah, people believe this. This yeah. is, yeah, yeah, yeah this, this is, is the ex huge. This <laughs> is the excuse for a lot of things. Um, you were saying the writing. Um, where did you do the writing? Was it f focused more on one place and one time mm. period, or has it been over the last three years, or maybe even before that? We are always writing. And we, in particular, in the last couple of years, explored certain narratives. We did a dance project together that I wrote and directed and Sierra was performing in, and Sierra played the child, the abandoned child. And in that story also came the grave digress. So, Although we weren't writing music, we were developing narratives even more um, more than we have in the past, more in a more kind of concentrated way. So when it came time to make the record, we had a lot of narrative sort of in our pocket and decided that we, we had this very urgent desire to make a record and to make it fast and I guess we had um, we already knew these stories very well so it was quite easy the musical part came easiest of all and how come easiest of all? you know the the previous record I would say wasn't easy at all so it's not necessarily our general experience okay. but so, I don't know I can't say why this time but it was very effortless and fast and I think it was the fact that we hadn't attempted to record and we had you know hadn't stepped foot into a studio but were working on other projects this developed a lot of the stories and the characters got you know a lot of momentum and um, energy behind them so when we came to music we were just so ready and it and it was an explosive process that happened in two weeks in our home studio in New York, the Coco Rosie Studios. And then we went to Iceland to, f you know, finish their architecture and, and sound design and um, the beat production.